Okay, hello, welcome, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we resume again our Tuesday seminar series of the University of Warsaw Astronomical Observatory. And today our guest came from the Alagator country, uh, from uh, University of Florida, Marek Szczepańczyk, and I'll, I, I'll ask Professor Wyszynska to introduce our speaker. So we, have a, we are really very happy to, to have you as a guest. Uh, Marek is a postdoc uh, at Florida University, but what is really very, very important, he's a very active member uh, in LIGO collaboration. I would say, I prefer to say Virgo, LIGO, Kaga collaboration. Uh, he has been working in, in, in LIGO for almost 10 years. And he was a uh, leader of uh, plenty of great projects. Uh, for example, uh, looking for a supernova explosion in the data, uh, being responsible uh, for intermediate black hole searches, so everything connected with birth. And now uh, you are responsible for others in uh, coming all for uh, <coughs> scientific uh, campaign, or which observational campaign which we are supposed to have to start this year. So, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And I uh, apologize if my voice will be a little bit uh, shaky, but uh, after spending a few years of flo in Florida and then coming for the winter, it's like you feel the difference. You come from summer to real winter. So, Today I'll be talking about uh, the topic that uh, I was pursuing since my PhD, and this is a search for the gravitational waves from Core Club Supernovae. Currently in LIGO, Virgo, Kagra, we are observing uh, black holes, binary neutron stars, and uh, all of the systems uh, that uh, have uh, two compact objects. But Core Club Supernovae are the, one of the most interesting uh, objects, phenomena that uh, we would like to observe. The last one was a long time ago, and uh, we hope that we observe them in additional wave spectrum uh, soon, hopefully in the next observing So, let me start. What are the Core Club Supernovae? Probably many of you are familiar, but uh, um, let me also make a refreshment. Quark Lab Supernovae are exploding stars. Uh, people were observing them for many millennia, but uh, they didn't know what was happening. For them, the sky was static, and then all of a sudden, a new star appears on the sky. So they were calling them Nova, and uh, for long, long time, they didn't know what was causing that to happen in the sky. Now, um, we know that uh, these are explosions uh, of massive stars. And uh, one of those uh, that, uh, that was observed 1,000 years ago is uh, in Crab Nebula. Uh, almost 1,000 years ago, uh, when the uh, Chinese at the time saw it, they made a note in their, in their writings, and uh, well, after one millennia, when we look roughly at the sky where they observed uh, that uh, Nova star, uh, we see this beautiful, beautiful object. So, Sorry. Oh, so, what is, uh, what uh, causes a star to explode. If you think about uh, burning in a star, then uh, burning is uh, uh, going from hydrogen, the simplest element, to helium, carbon, oxygen, all the way to iron, and the burning starts on iron, and uh, the heavier elements go inside the star, and uh, you have the star 
don't look like an onion shape with the heavier and heavier elements at the center. When that mass is uh, exceeding roughly Chandrasekhar mass, uh, one to five solar mass, then the gravity is uh, so strong uh, that uh, this, uh, we call it iron core, collapses and uh, it triggers uh, an explosion. It's a very, very violent uh, uh, collapse. And uh, when uh, we observe uh, them uh, optically, um, we observe uh, around 1% uh, of uh, what we calculate is available. So if you calculate the potential energy of that uh, iron core, it's around 50% uh, of a solar mass times C square, but uh, we observe optically only 1%. So uh, where does it, this, uh, exp uh, this, where's that uh, energy goes, this 99%? And it turns out that uh, uh, when you squeeze uh, this iron core so much, then protons start meeting electrons, creating uh, neutrons and uh, neutrinos. And uh, when in fact 99% uh, uh, of the energy escapes with the neutrinos, because neutrinos uh, interact very weakly with, with matter, uh, they escape pretty freely. And, um, uh, because there's such a strong uh, outcome, outflow of neutrinos, we think that uh, 99, that, uh, that uh, these neutrinos, even if they interact uh, a little bit, uh, they are capable to uh, blow up the star from, from, from inside. So this is this, let's move on. And uh, purple of supernovae are truly multi-mercenary sources. We have uh, neutrinos, we have gravitational waves, we have uh, optical spectrum. And uh, if we look at the time scale, uh, before the explosion happens, uh, we start having uh, a lot of neutrinos uh, uh, increase uh, in flux, so there is a lot of lot of neutrinos that start leaving the star. Uh, then we have moment of explosion, very violent, with gigantic uh, uh, increase uh, of the neutrino luminosity, and at the same time, um, gravitational waves for around uh, the first one second, and then uh, star explodes, breaks uh, the surface. And then we can see it uh, optically. Before that, uh, we cannot see any optical. Uh, we cannot see any optical counterpart. So I'm interested uh, in finding gravitational waves from the very first uh, second when uh, it is emitted, and um, um, different messengers can tell us uh, different things about uh, the source. Um, so far, we know that. Massive stars explode, but still, after a century of observing them, we are not sure why. Um, and uh, in order to uh, be certain to measure directly what is happening inside, uh, we have to measure um, basically the gravitational waves that will tell us uh, how the matter moves in inside, what are the resonances, and uh, how the collapsed core behave. Um, and uh, neutrinos will tell us. Uh, about the thermodynamics of uh, the sources. So we are looking forward to see the next uh, uh, galactic supernova when we can hopefully see all of these uh, messengers all together and learn what drives the explosion. So there are many different uh, processes that can uh, emit gravitational waves. And uh, here I divided them into uh, like a few parts. First of all, to produce gravitational waves, we need a certain asymmetry. Uh, if you think about uh, spherical asymmetry, uh, even fa fastly rotating, it doesn't emit gravitational waves. But if you have some sort of uh, instability, some sort of spherical asymmetry, then you can have uh, gravitational wave emission. And the more asymmetry, the bigger gravitational wave production. So the most of the energy comes from small region of, uh, of the proton neutron star. 
from the collapsed core. And um, the size of it is uh, like uh, around 50 kilometers that shrinks down to around 20, 30 kilometers. So it's a small region with very, very dense matter uh, where we uh, can have uh, some oscillations, resonances, we can have a convection inside, uh, the rotation and bounce, we can have a formation of black hole itself. Uh, and uh, this is the region where we hope to see the most of the gravitational wave uh, during the explosion. Then we can also have a turbulent flow of the matter. So matter can be pushed out by neutrinos, but then they can plumb into the proton neutron star. And we can also have some minor effects uh, related to magnetic fields. So this is the most interesting region for us that is very, very small, but uh, very dense in, uh, in very dense. And, uh, um, and this is the only region that we think we can understand gravitational waves from. So the, the neutrino gene explosion, um, out of uh, there are a few models of possible explosion. <coughs> uh, I was describing uh, primarily the, um, the model where, where neutrinos play the crucial role. Uh, but uh, we also can have uh, other possibilities. For example, if we have uh, a very rotating star uh, that uh, collapses, and enhancing magnetic field, uh, and that magnetic field basically drives jets that uh, blow the stars uh, along the rotation axis. Uh, so this is, uh, we believe, 99% of uh, explosions, and this is maybe like uh, magnetic rotation driven, like maybe one two percent uh, that uh, uh, that uh, of supernovae that uh, that we expect. So. This one is uh, what we realistic, re realistically focus on. But besides that, uh, there are also some other uh, expl uh, more extreme cases, like uh, uh, black hole formation with rapid rotations, uh, uh, hypernovae, uh, supernovae, no supernovae. Uh, we can also have uh, some very extreme deformations of the core. Uh, these are all like unlikely solutions, but still, Astrophysically cannot be ruled out, cannot be ruled out by experiment yet. Uh, but uh, um, with gravitational waves, actually, this is what I want to show. We start ruling out some of these models that uh, are unlikely, but um, cannot be ruled out uh, in any optical optical way. So let me talk about the searches and uh, how much time do I have? Okay. Half an hour. Half an hour. Okay. So, so let me talk. Oh, no, that's right. Okay. So let me talk uh, a little bit about the history of searching for gravitational waves. It ranges uh, for around uh, a decade. Um, um, for, uh, we have uh, so-called optically targeted searches. So we observe a supernova in the sky, and then uh, we. Uh, look at, uh, we interpolate uh, where we can find gravitational wave event, and um, we analyze the data and we see whether we find gravitational wave or not. And uh, we can also have uh, all, -time, all, -time, all time searches that uh, we don't know where, where supernova has exploded, so any place in the sky could produce uh, a, a, an event. So for the, with the initial LIGO the data, so data up to um, 2016, uh, we were searching, uh, we established uh, the search methods, and at that time we chose uh, four core collapse supernovae up to 15 megaparsecs. In the advanced detector era, with O102 data, which is uh, um, 2017, 2000, uh, uh, 18. Uh, we were able, for the first time, constrain the Corcolab supernova engine. We chose uh, five, five Corcolab supernovae and uh, uh, up to 20 megaparsecs. So in this search, for the first time, we are able to uh, constrain the models uh, that uh, drive the, the explosion, thanks to the gravitational wave data. And 
in this um, uh, in this um, observing in the past observing run uh, all three um, we have uh, cons we are constraining the uh, we are co uh, constraining the uh, emission uh, the collapse kind of engine even further and we provide more and more um, hopefully more meaningful res results and uh, in this presentation I will try to convince you uh, I will try to show you uh, all, all these results that are not, not are not uh, yet uh, public. And uh, in here we chose uh, nine protop supernovae up to 30 megaparsecs, so even further. So in order to search for gravitational resources, uh, we are using uh, model independent uh, algorithms, model independent methods. So um, unlikely uh, to uh, binary black holes, when we know exactly what uh, we are searching for, uh, we have templates and uh, we know what mass, what, what uh, uh, compact binary systems uh, we are searching for, uh, we can use much filtering. Um, but uh, when we don't know exactly what we are searching for, uh, when a source is stochastic, uh, we, we have to use uh, uh, the model independent methods and uh, we are using the pipeline that uh, uh, that uh, that is called coherent waivers, and uh, and uh, this uh, pipeline, this, this this method, uh, detected uh, uh, the very first gravitational wave. This is actually something that people don't really know. That uh, uh, even if we are, uh, if um, we have, uh, we can have an in a certain way, uh, optimal method for searching for gravitational waves with. Uh, exactly uh, what uh, what we expect um, the, the this uh, type of model independent searches that are not as constrained uh, we're able to detect it in low latency uh, right away and uh, this method also detected the, the heaviest binary black hole uh, later to date and uh, recently uh, the intermediate uh, mass binary black hole by 2019, uh, and also it's, uh, it's, it finds uh, uh, a lot of uh, other gravitational waves. Plus, uh, it is uh, capable to uh, detect for supernova supernova. And during the last observing run, if we would have galactic supernova, then it would be the only algorithm uh, that can detect it in uh, in real time. This um, this uh, type of algorithm uses uh, very minimal assumptions. Um, for certain sources. So, for example, for the binaries, uh, if we have um, uh, whatever, however we model it, our, our binary system, uh, we know when two masses uh, inspire, uh, go in spiral, then the frequency grows over time. And uh, depending on how fast it's growing over time, it tells us, it tells us uh, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the mass. So, um, how does it work? Uh, this is uh, an excess power method. So we take, we decompose the uh, data time series into uh, time frequency maps. We take uh, time frequency maps from each detector and we dump them uh, into one picture uh, where the gravitational wave is uh, enhanced while the noise uh, is uh, enhanced mu uh, much less. So it allows us to, uh, to detect uh, weaker and weaker signals. Then we take uh, uh, such, such an event and uh, with the inverse transform, we take it back to the frequency domain or time domain. And here you can see one of the examples of a signal uh, from core collapse supernova. So the signal is uh, here around uh, half a second long, but very broad, uh, up to two kilohertz. And if you think about binary sources, the cutoff is roughly up to like 300 hertz. So um, in order to search for core collapse supernovae, we have to extend way, way below, uh, up, way, way above uh, the binary black hole range. So before we jump to O3, uh, uh, a short uh, introduction with the O102 uh, search. 
in one or two, we had uh, five core collapse supernovae uh, up to distance of 20 megaparsec. The closest one was at seven megaparsecs. Uh, we haven't found any gravitational wave at the time. Um, and um, we were able to constrain the gravitational wave emission up to around uh, 10 to minus four of a solar mass at 200 hertz, so at lower frequency. But for certain uh, extreme emission models, so if you think about uh, very rapid rotation and uh, very strong deformation of the core, um, we can uh, uh, exclude them at a certain level that is non-zero and is up to 80% of the time. And uh, we can see this, such sources up to around uh, eight, uh, a, a little bit, a few kiloparsecs. Uh, this is the most realistic neutrino driven case. Uh, and for the magneto rotational driven, we can go beyond Milky Way. But uh, with some extreme models uh, up to large Magellanic cloud. So it's not, still not, not as far. Now, uh, we have these extreme models that, we, that, that lay somewhere here at the, uh, around the typical explosion energy. Uh, here we have the constraint, the, the best constraint that we update today. Uh, but uh, in order to reach uh, the realistic uh, neutrino driven explosions, uh, we basically have to go a few orders of magnitude still up to around. Uh, uh, 10 to minus 8 uh, solar masses uh, in Earth is like uh, 10 to minus uh, 47, 46. So it's still um, when the explosion, typical explosion is 10 to 51, we have uh, a few orders of magnitude to still to, to kill. Now, let me go to the uh, new results. Uh, these are results uh, with the um, up, uh, with the last uh, observed, with the last observed crown. Uh, these results are not yet public. Uh, it was to, supposed to be uh, the LIGO Vero collaboration paper, but uh, they still like uh, we don't have final final um, a decision of uh, whether we can publish it uh, uh, without that. Um, but uh, hopefully uh, it will be available soon on archive. Um, so let me let me start saying that um, um, this uh, in, with the O3 data we had nine core collapse supernovae, and uh, I show where the situation on the sky. The the distances were from 16 to 30 megaparsecs, and uh, we mainly have a typical type two core collapse supernovae, uh, one or two more energetic ones, 1b and 1c. Two of them exploded exactly in the same galaxy, and uh, another couple also exploded in the same galaxy, right here and right here. Uh, and uh, three of them were extensively studied by the astronomers. So we are happy that uh, we can also add more value to them. Um, so when we have collected the astronomical data, uh, we extrapolate to the time when we can uh, find the gravitational waves. And uh, uh, we call it uh, the period when we expect to see gravitational wave is, uh, is so-called uh, on-source uh, on window. Uh, and it ranges from around uh, uh, one day to over a week. So this is roughly the span when we can search when we where we are searching for gravitational wave source and uh, here we plot all of the nine supernovae with uh, hum, with amount of data we collected so when we looked at these time intervals we performed the background analysis uh, a lot of uh, tuning a lot of work and then we say okay it's it's done let's see if we can find any gravitational wave so most of, for most of the supernovae, uh, the photon probability is really, really high. So as uh, no surprise, uh, they are likely noise. But to spice up the, uh, the, our analysis, we found one event that is like almost three sigma con uh, confidence. So it's like, hmm, 
it's 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 worth to check check it. So uh, this is the most significant uh, event, and uh, how does it look? Uh, it is uh, pretty long, almost four seconds long event, very narrow band, uh, for uh, only four hertz at uh, around uh, 830 hertz. So it's a very very narrow and uh, long uh, long signal. Uh, the significance uh, is uh, uh, one per two years, uh, which, uh, if you calculate the uh, Fosnum probability, is, uh, is almost three sigma confidence. And um, um, we performed uh, uh, in LIGO a lot of uh, uh, a lot of studies of this event, and uh, we found that uh, it's uh, this signal is very strongly correlated uh, with the uh, radio frequency noise, so it's very likely noise. But uh, nevertheless. Uh, it was uh, something very uh, interesting and that triggers interest. If we think about uh, some extreme emission models, so if you think about uh, bar modes, um, if uh, such uh, morphology is true, uh, then uh, for certain instabilities, we have even 23% uh, 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 probability that uh, the signal is astrophysical. Um, and then there is also other uh, other possibilities as well, but uh, uh, it's a very pretty significant event for such search, but uh, it's very likely in noise. Um, then we analyzed uh, a lot of different uh, scenarios: uh, the neutrino-driven explosions, uh, the magnetorotational-driven explosions, quantum chronon dynamic uh, phase transition. Black hole formation and also extreme emission models uh, as well. So we in here we analyzed a pretty large range of different uh, possible uh, models. Now um, we, as before, we plotted the detection efficiency. So these are detection efficiencies for the um, for all sorts of uh, models that we have. Um, the cumulatively, the largest distance that we can observe uh, is at 14 kiloparsecs for the realistic uh, explosion. Uh, realistic, um, maybe mm, more extreme, but still uh, realistic. Um, then the magnetorotational driven explosions that um, um, with the updated uh, models, because they are um, change. Uh, um, people are learning more and more about these models. Uh, for those that we studied, uh, it was around 16 kiloparsec. For the quantum chronodynamics dynamics phase transition, uh, up to 2 kiloparsecs, so we are not reaching yet a uh, uh, Milky Way. Black hole formation for this specific model is uh, eight uh, uh, less than 1 kiloparsec. And then for several extreme emission models, like here, we can uh, find gravitational waves up to the distances of our supernovae. So it's great. So if we don't detect any gravitational waves, it means that uh, this model don't well explain the core collapse supernova engine. So therefore, we start uh, constraining excluding one. And one of the results, uh, one of the constraints that we put is the gravitational wave energy, upper limits on the gravitational wave emission from all the way from 50 hertz to 2 kilohertz. And this is the whole range of uh, uh, frequencies uh, that uh, still are possible, uh, that uh, modelers can still, still use in their models. And the best uh, uh, constraint are, are around uh, 10 to minus 4 at uh, the lowest frequencies. And uh, the worst uh, are at, uh, at the higher, highest frequencies. The typical explosion energy is 10 to 51. The hypernova explosion energy is uh, uh, almost uh, 10, 100 uh, more. So we are here uh, uh, capable to constrain uh, gravitational wave emission uh, in a meaningful way. Now, we can also constrain the power emitted in gravitational waves. So 
uh, power is basically amount of energy divided by the duration. So how dynamical is the source? Amount of energy emitted in certain period of time. And for here, we also have uh, explored from 50 to 50 hertz to, to kilohertz. And um, uh, we get that uh, um, um, are at, ten to, uh, at lowest frequencies, uh, we, uh, the emission is uh, as strong as uh, 10 to minus 3 per sec uh, solar masses per second. This is the, uh, the outflow in gravitational waves. And uh, in uh, uh, highest frequencies, uh, uh, up to 10 times, uh, uh, 10 times uh, solar mass per second. So this is the, the first constraint. This is uh, the first uh, uh, constraint that uh, that are provided for this type of sources. Now um, the next uh, constraint are the core deformations. Um, so if we assume that uh, a core goes into the bar mode, like here, and people, the modelers still are achieving uh, bar modes for very rapidly rotating stars. Uh, we are able to uh, to constrain them to ellipticity of uh, around uh, one or maybe a little bit uh, below one. Uh, you can see that uh, ellipticity is proportional to the strain. So um, the um, the more uh, the larger ellipticity of the source, so larger deformation then proportionally the gravitational waves uh, are stronger. And since we don't have gravitational wave uh, detection, uh, then we can set these uh, upper limits. Then um, we can we provide also so-called model exclusion probabilities. So if we take, uh, 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 we take the models, like a few specific models, and then uh, I will not go into the details, uh, we accumulate uh, uh, the probabilities of the model of, being, of uh, not being correct. Uh, and uh, uh, we say that uh, oh, this particular emission is not probable up to 50% uh, or 90, 95%. So uh, we can see that we can start excluding uh, a very long and very high frequency emission. Uh, for uh, for certain uh, emissions, uh, and uh, and it gives uh, uh, this uh, and this type of results rely on not individual sources, but uh, uh, all of them combined. So instead of analyzing one source at a time, uh, we take uh, or we combine results from all together, uh, all of them, and. Uh, uh, if we look at the core deformations from this, all, all of this combined, then we can go even further. That uh, we can uh, go even to um, uh, to smaller ellipticities, uh, showing that uh, uh, we've observing accumulating more and more core collapse supernovae, more and more sources. Optically, we are capable to constrain the engine even further, and. Uh, um, and we can exclude them at uh, at different different uh, levels. And these are still preliminary results that uh, uh, that uh, we we are checking. So as a summary, the uh, the Corcup supernovae are exploding stars, and uh, the next exploding star in our galaxy will be one of the most interesting astronomical events. So we'll be all cheering, uh, and we hope that we will detect them. In gravitational wave spectrum, optically uh, likely we will see them uh, in the, ne the neutrinos. Super likely that uh, uh, we will see them. Uh, uh, we were performing searches for the last uh, uh, almost ten years, and uh, uh, we established the methodology. We started constraining the color supernova engine, and uh, specifically in this optically targeted search. Uh, we have uh, a nine core collapse supernovae up to 30 megaparsecs. Uh, we have uh, a very interesting almost three sigma event, but very likely nice. Um, 
we can detect gravitational waves up to 14 kiloparsecs, 16 kiloparsecs, and uh, uh, we start gathering more and more meaningful uh, constraints uh, of this core collapse supernova engine in terms of the emitted energy and emitted power uh, deformation. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, we be uh, allowed to paper to put the paper soon on archive. So thank you very much. Thank you. Just move this window up. Yes. Thank you very much for this very in inspiring talk. Questions from the audience here. I have, in fact, two questions. The first one is, let's assume that you would be so lucky that in all forms, so in a few months, we can have a supernova in our galaxy, yes? Are we ready for that from the additional way point of view? I mean, if, uh, uh, if we can really extract uh, some information, so tell us what was happening. Can you, for example, what is the crucial, uh, let's say, parameter which you can extract for such kind of explosion? And if you can infer something from this explosion about what was happening, if it was the neutrino driven core collapse or it was the other one, what was the what were the properties of this uh, core forming that? What kind of thing we can uh, get from it? If it uh, happened now, yes, just would say this year. And then, what kind of sensitivity, this is the second question, should we have? I don't know if for LIGO we can have something like that, to be able to go beyond our galaxy to see something more far away. So, uh, we perform all these searches because uh, this is a very good preparation. And I would split here the detection itself from extracting uh, the parameters, extracting the physical information. Yeah, first, we have to make sure that uh, whatever clump of energy we, we, we see is uh, significant and uh, this is a gravitational wave. And then uh, we can drive these uh, conclusions. Uh, the first conclusion that uh, uh, we, can, we can extract is... Uh, okay, perfect. Is uh, when we look at the morphology, um, you can see a very, very broad broadband signal with uh, lower frequencies and higher frequencies. Uh, lower frequencies are related to, to uh, the shock. So when the shock is uh, uh, moving uh, outward, it's heat up and uh, is uh, going to blow at the star, um, it can oscillate. So this is the low frequency. If we see low frequency emission, then oh, it's probably there is some sloshing mode of the of the shock, and then the most likely we will see uh, the this strong signal uh, that is uh, related to to this core uh, of the protein cooling phase of the protein neutron star. So if you have a core that collapses uh, down to around 50 kilometer, it shrinks to uh, 20, 30 kilometers down to a uh, neutron star. Uh, then the gravitational wave, uh, um, because the, the density of matter is uh, getting higher and higher, uh, the gravitational wave uh, is also are getting, uh, uh, getting, getting higher. Uh, so we believe that this type of signature uh, that is uh, related to the cooling phase is the first, uh, the first one that uh, uh, that uh, mm, that we will detect. Uh, if we have, uh, oh, I have actually uh, backup studies that can help. Yes. So here I show uh, how the gravitational wave emission changes with time, and uh, you can have when you have very very strong initial uh, energy. Uh, and a very strong signal, then uh, it's uh, most likely due to the very rapid uh, core rotation and bounce. Um, here, actually, this is not rotating scenario, so you have uh, uh, nothing, or like not, not much. And then uh, if you have uh, a rotating case, 
then you have a, a very, very strong signal uh, at the very beginning uh, when the star collapses. And then you can also have this uh, uh, modes of oscillation that, uh, that, that are growing. So um, people are trying to develop now methods to extract this physical information, like what is the cooling rate of the proton neutron star, uh, what is possibly the rotation rate, uh, and the, from gravitational wave, we should be able to tell uh, what are these parameters are. But can you say what was the mass? Um, not yet. It's, it's actually model dependent of the proton neutron star. It's uh, th this uh, type of frequency evolution depends uh, on certain combination of uh, um, mass and radius and some other uh, parameters. So. Um, yeah, we have only one, 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 uh, one um, evolution, but there is like a few entangled uh, parameters that uh, it's hard to disentangle. But then, just to, yeah, just to complement this, oh. but then from optical observations, if you happen to have any, then you can constrain these basic parameters a little bit better, right? Mm, not not really from optical because uh, everything that uh, goes to, to the optical um or well, really you have a very early spectrum for example or the, the steel, 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 steel. yeah yeah right. it's because it uh, it takes a few hours to a few days to to reach and then all the information of what is happening inside is actually lost, it's lost. unless yeah. the star is very small uh yeah. like uh, all the envelope is strict so uh, then yeah, maybe there will be some information, but in principle, um, that, that's why we need to, uh, the, the, the gravitational wave actually searches are the, basically at the moment, the only search, the only ways to constrain the, super, uh, the engine. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes Well, so <coughs> you, you have shown this limit as a function of frequency, and uh, I like you to, I'd like to ask, how do you define these limits? Like, if you have a limit at, say, 40 Hz, do you assume that all the power goes at the frequency 40 Hz, or is it at some frequency interval? And if so, then what is this interval? How, does it, how do you calculate that? Yeah, so uh, it's a very simplified uh, case. Uh, when we uh, probe, uh, uh, basically, if a very na narrow band, uh, uh, signals, so uh, one frequency beam at a time. Uh, so nature can uh, can have a, can give us uh, uh, sources uh, emitting at uh, 100 hertz, one kilohertz, something in between. Uh, so in the future uh, we'll try to take it, but uh, uh, for now uh, we just uh, uh, assume one frequency at a time. So it's a very uh, strong simplification, uh, but uh, this is uh, what uh, allows us to, um, to, to, to make these constraints. So, yeah, like as, assuming so, that. So, do, so, should I understand this that you know, if there was a, a emission in many frequencies, then I should integrate this curve to find the, uh, the total energy emitted? Um, actually, maybe in a, in a different, uh, maybe, maybe in a different way, maybe, maybe not, not integrating, but uh, um, if it, uh, for say 100 hertz, uh, um, we don't find any, uh, any gravitational wave data, so any of these possibilities is actually, uh, for any of the supernovae that we have, it's not, uh, it's not, it was not realized. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, it, it, it can be, but it's still too weak. And uh, our limits are based on the uh, best uh, constraint that, 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 that we get there. Uh, we can say this, uh, this, this red, 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 curve, red curve. So, yeah, it, the, it can be integrated, but that's why we have like showing this belt of uh, of different possibilities. And maybe the question about uh, the future, right? Uh, so if you think about uh, detection efficiency curves, 
um, like how far we can detect. So this is uh, around uh, uh, 10 kiloparsec, around the galactic center. If you think about uh, the next generation detectors that are 10 times uh, uh, or 20 times uh, more sensitive from now, uh, then you just basically multiply all these numbers by 10. So for this, we will go to uh, 140 kiloparsecs, 160 kiloparsecs. So these are the most uh, uh, extreme, like the, the, uh, the, the best uh, possible scenarios. Uh, for the less optimistic, it will reach uh, the galactic center. Uh, but uh, there are certain advantages uh, that we study. If we have a signal here, we know, we know that our oh, gravitational waves uh, are happening somewhere in the interval of a uh, few days. But uh, if we know exactly the timing, then we can extend it even further. And uh, at the moment, we actually study how far, how far we can reach if we have uh, uh, the, the signal from the neutrons that we know precisely where it's happening and then how far we can, we can detect it. But, uh, in, uh, but uh, uh, in the basic searches, uh, we basically can go beyond the Milky Way, but not as much further with the, science, with the standard methods. So the neutrino detections, they don't go much further than this, right? They can detect LHC, but not much further than that. Uh, yeah, the estimates is uh, like 100, 300 kiloparsecs. So a little bit further. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the energy, uh, like uh, for us, we measure strain, which uh, goes like uh, one over distance. For them, the flux is going uh, like uh, uh, one over distance squared. So it, it's dying, dying faster. So yeah, it's um, yeah. They, they will see thousands of neutrinos uh, from a source in the galaxy, but then it will be decreasing really fast outside the galaxy. Okay. Any questions? Oh, I have a question. Uh, what are the things that mean? Uh, you have a galactic detector that's gravitational waves. Uh, is it? By any means useful to uh, treat it as a gradient or uh, a follow up? And what's with the colorization and PP useful? So, yeah, that's the. Because it becomes scary, right? So, we can firstly, it should be like other kinds of systems. Yes, so if a supernova explodes in our, our galaxy and we, 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 we will have the neutrino signal um, and then uh, LIGO will have uh, an alert system of um, uh, for binary black holes and uh, a so-called uh, burst unmodeled sources and uh, if uh, they are detected then uh, fairly significantly, then uh, the sky localization timing uh, uh, will be um, will be sent uh, sent uh, uh, to the astronomers. Uh, but uh, if the event is uh, kind of substantial, doesn't pass, uh, uh, the, so then will be LIGO will be <laughs> bombarded by outside uh, at the outside world. Um, and um, yeah, we'll be trying to figure out uh, whether we detected it or not, uh, because we have uh, we have, we are getting pre prepared for any type of morphology, any type of possibility. But uh, still, if it happened uh, when the detectors were off, or when the detectors uh, uh, the supernova happened in the less sensitive area of the sky, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, then, yeah, maybe it will be not detected or it will be below the level, the threshold uh, levels. So that's like, a, so then we will not have, uh, we will not have an alert. But if it passes the threshold, it, the outside world will know automatically the sky localize, sky area where you can find it and um, some other properties. So 
fingers crossed. <laughs> so to understand this, so you will be running some kind of template match in O4, yeah. which recognizes CC. Yes, right? Yes, yes. And I will be in charge. So, I, okay. <laughs> so this will be, uh, we will be able to distinguish them easily, right? Um, uh, yeah, the, 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 yeah, yeah we'll, um, uh, there will not be binary black holes for sure. We will see them see them directly. Uh, but then, um, yeah, even from the frequency range, below 300 hertz and uh, above 300 hertz. So we're expecting the signal uh, up to one one kilohertz. Yeah. So yeah, that's this is where we can find it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That will be yeah. We will be running into hopefully the signal will be strong, strong enough. So I was wondering because you've done the, the, the search, you took the optical supernovae and then you matched them with GW. How about the other way around? If you looked through the entire GW data and then looked for any um, optical counterparts to that, it's a bit interesting question. And uh, now we have the uh, uh, the search for all types of sources mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, for perhaps supernova, cosmic things, some um, glitching of neutron stars, and uh, uh, we uh, we look for the uh, what are the possible gravitational waves. Possible events, and uh, um, yeah, we haven't been matching them with the optical uh, supernovae. And that's really interesting to see. Well, you can do it even further because, of course, the localization is an issue. But then, if you know where your candidate was, then you can look into the archives and not through the optical alerts, you can actually dig into and with force and um, imaging, you can find that there was a thing. Yeah. yeah, people perform uh, the coincidence searches where they take the archive from uh, optical search, uh, from any type of uh, uh, astronomical searches and they match them with uh, the gravitational wave events. And uh, so far, I haven't nothing uh, been found, but uh, it was uh, uh, the general cases uh, when we don't distinguish between uh, supernova and uh, and other. So we were not matching them directly with supernova. Mm -hmm. So, I will have yet another question. So, what if there is a supernova in our galaxy? Well, not a supernova in our galaxy, but uh, just a collapse formation of like that, that you would see yeah. immediately because there will be no optical counterpart, right? Um, the models actually are still fairly young okay. and it uh, could be. So for 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 uh, black hole formation, uh, we should be able to see the uh, the high frequencies until the signal dies. When the, well, that's the paper of one twenty one, is it? Yeah, and, uh, that's what you mean by the confirmation. Yeah, exactly. And this, and this outer has this is non rotating, uh, slowly rotating, and fast rotating. And the fast rotating can be seen like far far away right. so these models are still not yet uh, like fully fully mature uh, but not like uh, definitely and uh, uh, we don't know how much uh, of gravitational wave we can expect from the black hole formation because um, how asymmetric will be the formation uh, will it be more like, spherical than mm -hmm. less gravitational wave or there will be like uh, I don't know, like uh, in, in a different form, then we can have some something more. There must be some rotation. There's always rotation. Yeah, yeah. So, so there must be some asymmetry. Mm -hmm. So, so, so But for the neutrinos, we see it uh, very well that uh, uh, will be a very abrupt uh, cut in the neutrino emission. So, if they are matching with gravitational wave, then that will be a little bit sweet. Yeah, but the range is only 0.8 kilobytes. For this specific like realization of the model, yeah, okay. yeah. it can be like uh, for other models when you have fast rotation is uh, like uh, one hundred times further even. Then. So the range can can uh, can really go up and down. Cool. Okay, I don't see any more questions, so let's thank our speaker again. Thank you for joining. Thank <laughs> you.